there are several different ways that people can ask scientific questions, some of which are more qualitative, where you want to know, does this phenomenon occur or not? But there are also other quantitative type questions, which get at how often does something occur, or by what extent does this phenomenon occur? If you think about pretty much every scientific paper that you read, it fits in one of these categories. What is there? How does it work? And why is it like that? And they're all important aspects of science. What is there can be technique papers, right, that let you see something that you couldn't see before, or screens, right, Th these sorts of hypothesis generating, large scale, sort of systematic efforts. A lot of functional genomic efforts can look like that. How does it work, right? This is a, a question that draws on mechanism, right? Which is, I think, a really interesting uh, word because it means something different to like every different subfield of biology, right? So some people think that a mechanism is how particular amino acids wiggle around in a protein. Some people think mechanism is how two proteins interact together. Some people think mechanism is a circuit diagram, right? So it happens at different scales, but they're all related to this explanation of the parts and how the parts work together. And then the last one is this question of why is it like that? This is one of the where biology can get ph philosophical, but often um, evolution can fall into this category too, right? So uh, how did the system end up the way that it is? Or what are the costs and benefits of the system design? Like what are the trade-offs in that? So I think if you, if you try hard to break down every paper that you read into these categories, you can start seeing how they, they really do fit into these categories. One of the important aspects of coming up with a scientific question is actually just refining it down to something that is answerable. And so for example, you might be interested in studying evolution. One student that joined the lab who was interested in this area was uh, particularly interested in studying the adaptive immune system as a complex evolving population that literally evolves in real time um, as we're exposed to different pathogens, as we get vaccines, how does our an uh, antibody repertoire evolve um, or develop to combat that antigen that, it, that it's attacking. And so to go from this broad question of studying evolution in, in real time to studying something that is a, a very focused question, such as how does the immune system respond to a vaccine, um, is one way of thinking about how you can take a broad question of interest, hone it down to something that is answerable. An example might be something like, I want to study the 3D architecture of the nucleus. Well, that's great. 3D architecture of the nucleus is very interesting but it's an area, it's not a question, right? And even something like, what does the 3D architecture of the nucleus look like, isn't a good scientific question because it's too broad, right? So the art of taking a sort of general area that you're interested in and then pushing on it until it's a very specific idea about how the field thinks about it currently and whether that can account for some prediction you might have or some type of experiment you might do is the, is, is the key. And often that question is narrower than students realize. Pretty much any question um, needs to um, be thought about. You, know, you have to focus on whether or not the question itself is indeed answerable. And if it's not a question that you can really uh, come up with a technique for answering, then you need to refine the question. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a good question or a bad question. It just means that the, the question itself may need some refinement. I think the biggest question and the most important question you can ask yourself is how will the field be different after I answer this question? Right? And that means that you need to consider what the current thinking is in the field and what the current sort of methodology is in the field. And so will you confirm an existing idea that people are already pretty confident in? That might not be a great scientific question. The people who join my lab are very interested in um, 
taking technologies or things that we do in our lab and making a difference in the medical world. And so uh, one of the ways that we try to motivate our scientific question is by uh, figuring out where are the unmet needs that are out there. Um, and they could be basic science unmet needs, they can be uh, clinical unmet needs. But before we pursue a question, sort of asking the question, so what? If we, best case scenario, everything worked, what would this actually do? Um, and if we can't answer that, we generally uh, step back and say, well, maybe that's not the right question or the right approach to take. You know, and it's not always so easy, right? You, you, sometimes you don't know what will be the, the end goal, but at least it's a place to start. There are like a set of litmus test questions that you can ask yourself to evaluate your own scientific question. So one is, is there some hypothesis that's already out in the field but isn't tested? So people might think differently in the sense that if you confirm it, they might finally feel confident that this is a, this is a real phenomenon. Is there a hypothesis that you think needs to be overturned? That's a big one. People will think very differently about things if that is true. Are there ways that people have been doing experiments that are technically limiting? such that you do things in a technically new way that allows them to think about the question and do it uh, and do their work in, an, in a new way. That can be another really good kind of question. But not all questions have to be revolutionary, right? I think that there can also be really good scientific questions that are taking existing ideas and moving them into a new system where you might be able to do different kinds of experiments. Right? So that's also can be incredibly valuable where you're not changing conceptually how people are thinking about a problem, but you're enabling like a whole different sort of sphere to work on that problem. This year's Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology went to uh, Yoshinori Osumi, who discovered autophagy in yeast. He described the pathway that was already known in mammalian cells, but in a, in a situation much like I had done for secretion that allowed the molecular details to be elucidated in a way that was not going to be possible in mammalian cells. He published two papers um, on which his Nobel Prize was based, one in the Journal of Cell Biology and the next in Feb's Letters. Neither of those papers would have been accepted by Cell Nature and Science because they weren't flashy, because, you know, yeast, uh, autophagy, you know, what, what does that mean? And, and it was only clear to those who could see what advantage he, he uh, provided that uh, the, the, this was going to uh, solve the problem. Finding a problem like that uh, is the challenge. And that, that's what I think the most creative people do. They find a challenge like that and a, and a potential solution. That's the kind of thing that, to me, is the most exciting. It's not that everything that you do uh, has to pass this test of novelty. If you're sequencing a human chromosome, uh, there's not much innovation because someone next door sequenced another human chromosome. You sort of do the same thing. It's not innovative, but is it important? Is it impactful? Is it will it be significant? So I think innovation and, and novelty are things that uh, you want to have at the kind of big picture level, but don't have to be drilled down to every experiment. So I I think the broadest, again, just to reiterate, the sort of broadest advice is to think about how will the world change? How will your field change? How will your lab's thinking or um, doing change after this gets answered? And you want something to change, right? You don't want it to just sort of, everybody's just sort of happily going along. You want to be able to define yourself some aspect of how your work will impact what's going on. Thank you.